Welcome to the Heatbler F4E Phantom 2 Episode 4, the APQ-120 Radar Part 1. Follow along as we explore the features of the Phantom's radar, its capabilities, quirks, and limits. Join us on a journey back through time when radars were shrouded in raw returns and operators had to break through the clutter to wield their full potential and power. The addition of the internal gun in the F4E required redesigning the nose of the Phantom, which limited the room available for the radar. The solution adopted was the Westinghouse AN APQ120, one of the first fully solid state radars compact enough to satisfy the dimensional requirements whilst limiting the loss of performance. Unlike more modern radars, the AN-APQ-120 is a pulse radar with minimal clutter filtering. Nevertheless, the F-4E was an excellent fighter regardless of its assigned mission, as demonstrated especially by American, Israeli, and Iranian pilots and whizzos during the conflicts of the second half of the 20th century. A pulse radar transmits a radio pulse focused in one direction. If any obstacle is in that direction, including another aircraft, ground shapes, or buildings, it will partly reflect back to the radar. With the time that it took the signal to travel back to the radar, the distance to the obstacle can be computed. The radar waves are produced in the magnetron, which are sent to a feed horn that reflects them onto the radar dish. The reflection from the radar antenna and physical effects such as diffraction produce the beam shape. Because the reflections each have different angles, the beam shape results in a main lobe and the side lobes. The radar is duplexed, which allows it to both emit and receive waves, which in turn allows a radar image to be formed based on the received returns. The returning reflections that are picked up by the antenna are sent to a receiver, which amplifies the return. Additionally, the amplifier gain can increase or decrease the amplification of the signal, which can help make the picture more clear. While automatic and instant automatic gain control are working in the background, the gain can also be manipulated by the radar operator manually to break out a clearer image. In any one moment, the image for that particular azimuth is displayed on the screen, and as the antenna sweeps, the picture of the reflections builds. In the Heatbler F4E, all of these components are simulated to great accuracy, resulting in a natural radar image that is based on true ray casting. Whatever your radar beam illuminates, be it a mountain, the ground, or an aircraft, reflects back to the radar and feeds the picture, raw and almost unfiltered, including returns from both the main lobe and the side lobes. Working with an unfiltered radar image, of course, presents different challenges the radar operator has to deal with, particularly if the conditions are unfavorable or his gain, azimuth, and elevation are not set up correctly. Due to diffraction, the waves do not all get reflected from the radar dish in the same direction, but in different angles, they form a beam shape that not only consists of the main lobe and its clutter, like the ground behind an aircraft masking its return, but they also produce side lobes and an altitude line. Additionally, the radar picks up thermal noise, which can be seen at higher gain settings. It can get distorted further by ECM effects, and the image even depicts the C state, with a higher C state returning higher reflection. As its ground mapping capabilities allow it to pick up ocean waves, you can easily test this yourself upon release by setting up strong wind and flying either parallel or perpendicular to the waves. As you turn in and out of the wind, you will be able to see how the reflection of the waves changes on the image, depending on their angle. All of these effects can influence the radar image either positively or negatively. But not only that, also your flying can influence the radar image. 
polarization can affect reflections if you are banked, resulting in stronger ground returns. Locking with the wrong range will result in the target being dropped. Locking with the wrong antenna azimuth or elevation can result in the target being tracked by a side lobe. With the wrong gain set, a target may appear or disappear even without ground clutter present. And most importantly, due to the wide variety of different signal amplitudes received, a near target will require a different gain than a distant target, which is why gain cannot be set for any one situation, but needs to be constantly adjusted as the target approaches or the aircraft that is operating the radar changes its aspect to the illuminated picture, and thus the reflected clutter keeps constantly changing too. A higher gain may illuminate the target better, but it will also add more clutter to the mix, which can camouflage the target again. Automatic gain control adjusts the amplification bias based on the average level of the return in the tracking gate while tracking a target. But because signals with a lower duration are in general of bigger interest in air-to-air -air operation, instantaneous automatic gain control is used to adjust for each received signal and can provide some limited filtering for larger returns like ECM and large areas of ground clutter. This filter only applies to the short pulse mode, however, Unless operating a modern radar, neither is sufficient to provide a well-adjusted picture for any one specific desired signal or target, which is why manual gain is provided to the operator to further fine-tune the amplification bias for a better and cleaner picture in search. The altitude line and side lobes add even more obstacles to the mix for the radar operator to deal with. While clutter from the main lobe can be easily identified as ground return, for examples like rivers, lakes, mountains, and cities, clutter from the side lobes picks up ground returns much closer to the aircraft and is much more patchy due to the weaker energy of the reflection and can be easily mistaken for a valid target return by an operator who did not yet learn to interpret the many smudges and spots. The altitude line is a common feature in all airborne pulse radars. In a presentation of range versus azimuth, it appears as a line across the scope for all azimuths at a range equal to the altitude of the aircraft. Fun fact, for even older radars, it was particularly strong over water and seriously impacted naval interceptions of aircraft with such radars. As one had to be close and follow the target for visual identification, the target could disappear in the altitude line and therefore be lost before establishing visual identification or carrying out a successful intercept. One can observe the altitude line move up and down if the radar is aircraft stabilized and radar elevation is changed. The altitude line should be filtered in CAA, so it should inhibit the lock of any targets in the altitude line. However, in addition, the CAA can lock spurious returns. Even if the operator has an ideal, clear picture with only one very obvious target signal, he can easily lock behind the target as the distance to the signal keeps decreasing between TDC placement and lock actuation, which results in a bad or invalid lock. Wizos used several methods to determine a valid lock, like checking for range and closure rate, among other things, using the aspect switch to display additional information during a lock. Becoming a skilled WIZO requires a comprehensive grasp of various factors. It's essential to comprehend not just the effects of the main and side lobes and gain, but also how to adeptly manipulate radar settings for optimal visualization. 
Additionally, understanding nuances like thermal noise and distinguishing electronic countermeasures such as chaff and jammers from the desired target are critical elements of proficiency in this role. In the Heat Blur Simulations F4E Phantom 2, we simulate the AN APQ120 in its entirety. All the radar effects and underlying components depicting functionality and imagery of the radar as true to real life as possible. We are simulating even more intricate effects of the radar such as pulse width, which affects the width of the pulse in time, resulting in the target appearing longer or shorter in height. Nutation, to steer the antenna in track, the APQ120 employs a common technique known as conical scanning. The beam is offset by a small angle and spun approximately 50 times per second around the antenna axis. The resulting signal can be used to steer the antenna to the strongest source, which keeps the antenna pointing at the target. With nutation, on the average, beam width will be higher, but the radiation energy will also be spread over a larger area, resulting in a less strong signal. Polarization. The radiation from the magnetron is polarized linearly. Polarization and angle of incidence can affect the reflectivity of a surface, which results in reduced clutter reflections with the correct orientation. The radar is, however, not roll stabilized, and rolling 90 degrees puts the polarization closer to the plane of polarization for the ground surface, resulting in increased clutter reflections. And in comparison, the effect of the fixed IFF antennas during a turn. Speaking of IFF, the APQ120 radar suite is also integrated with the APX80 interrogation system. Thus, WIZOs frequently used IFF as an additional means to display friendly targets that are not visible on the radar image yet. Through Combat Tree, this method was later used to display non-friendly targets before they could be picked up by the main antenna, too. This method was also used around airports to identify friendly traffic early on, if you will, like a poor man's early TCAS. General detection range of the APQ-120 is somewhere between 40 and 50 nautical miles for larger targets like bombers, but closer to 25 nautical miles for smaller, fighter-sized targets. The radar can use a 1-bar or 2-bar scan, providing a max coverage of 10.45 degrees vertically. All of this raw and unfiltered imagery and lack of range and automation of more modern radars and the comparatively high workload makes for an excellent ground mapping radar and great airborne intercept radar for predominantly known targets, but generally a not so great search radar as we're used to in DCS from its much more modern counterparts. In real life, Phantoms were guided to their target's general location by GCI stations or early AEW aircraft like the EC-121 Warning Star. That's a negative on the IFF. And then used the radar to pick up and break out the targets for an intercept or identification. 12 o'clock, Fencer. To guide the AIM-7 Sparrow, the radar uses a klystron emitter, which emits a second beam through the feed horn at a different frequency to guide the missile. 1002, 1003, 1004, shoot that sucker! The Sparrow is tuned to the same frequency as the aircraft's continuous wave emitter. Flash, got him! while the pulsed radiation is used for target tracking and antenna steering. The continuous wave radiation illuminates the target in the same way as the pulsed radiation. However, the nature of the continuous wave radiation makes it easy to track the Doppler of the resulting signal. When a sparrow is to be fired, the calculated closure rate of the target is used to set the expected Doppler of the target in the Sparrow and once the missile is released, it will then scan for the target in a narrow range around the expected Doppler. 
Once locked on, the sparrow tracks the Doppler of the target. It is important for the sparrow to receive both the reflections from the target and be illuminated directly to correctly calculate the target Doppler as the launching platform Doppler changes. It is important that before shooting, the radar antenna is pointing at the target so that the sparrow antenna can be positioned correctly to acquire the target after launch. A significant advancement from earlier F4 models was the implementation of the Digital Scan Converter Group, or DSCG. This system included the DSCG control panel in the pilot's cockpit and the pedestal group in the WISO cockpit. Its standout feature, however, was a digital display boasting impressive specifications. A high resolution of 160 by 512 with seven shades of green and a total memory storage of 500 kilobits dedicated to holding radar images for display. This marked a substantial improvement over the earlier DVST technology, which relied on screen phosphors for radar image memory. Its biggest trade-off was that images tended to fade quickly, which the new digital display did not share. Instead, it allowed for enhanced versatility and interactivity. Given that your primary interaction with radar systems will be through this display, meticulous effort was made to faithfully replicate its real-life counterpart in our recreation. Okay, I got it. Uh, captured ground vehicle. The DSCG also functions as the display system for the Tizio, Pave Spike, and TV-guided weapon imagery. Oh, 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 impact. The integration of the AN-APQ-120 with the WRCS to support air-to-ground ranging and weapons delivery provided even more benefits and helped the F-4 turn into the ultimate Cold War multi-role workhorse for which we know and revere it today. For new F-4E Wizzos, the AN-APQ-120 radar may seem daunting and laborious However, fear not. With a bit of experience and training, one can quickly and easily learn not only to manipulate the radar picture, but also to interpret it correctly to one's own advantage. Together with the newly recreated RWR, Jester 2.0, and HBUI, the AN-APQ-120 certainly represents one of the largest and more time-intensive parts of simulating the F-4E to the highest possible level of fidelity. We hope you enjoyed part one of the introduction to the AN-APQ-120 radar. As we cover the very basics and principal functions of the radar, we'll dive deeper into its operation and usage in the upcoming part two of this episode. We will take a closer look at its various controls and use cases. Hope to see you back next time. Until then, I'm Gray Wolf, voice of Jester AI. Keep scanning and don't forget to check six.